Hello everyone, welcome back to My Hero Academia Podfix. Today I'll be reading A Thief's Heart. This is a Monoma and Izuku one-shot. Uh, it's a really great fic, I like it a lot. Definitely a rare pairing though, so I hope you guys enjoy. Oh? What's that? Do I see the soulless shambling corpses of defeated rejects before me? No. No, surely not. It's Class 1A, after all. They couldn't be so exhausted and pathetic after just a bit of training time in Jim Gamma. Hmm. UA's finest couldn't possibly... The aggressive, patronizing tone was cut off violently and abruptly by Kendo Itsuka's swift chop, and Monoma's crumpled body fell into a heap on the floor. Izuku bit the inside of his cheek. That looked pretty painful, actually. Forgive us yet again. I swear we let him out of our sight for just a second, and he's already making trouble. You'd think our own training would have led him of his antagonistic behavior, but no. The girl commented, shaking her head. Give the fucker a leash, then. Kajan mumbled, and Izuku shot him a glare that went unnoticed, but the blonde focused on adjusting his gauntlets, and Kirishima was polite enough to give him a nudge of disapproval. Kaminari and Saro, on the other hand, had actually had to be scolded by Ida for their loud laughter. Izuku rolled his eyes. Things just couldn't be easy between everyone, could they? Yayorozu took a few steps forward, tucking a strand of hair behind her ear. It's quite all right, Kendo-san. We're admittedly a bit high-strung ourselves. She looked down, quickly wiping soot and dust from the bottom of her hero outfit. She laughed nervously. So believe us, we know how tensions can rise like this. Kendo smiled, and Izuku had the distinct sense that the softness in that look was exclusively for the class vice president, not the group as a whole. Good to hear. I'd hate to push away my... our best competition, Yagirozu. I feel much the same, Kendo-san. Just Kendo is fine, you know. Yagirozu actually blushed a bit at that. Jiro hid the word gay in a poorly disguised cough that only served to make their vice president blush even harder. The classes sort of meddled together, and as they walked back to the dorms, Tetsu Tetsu dragging Monoma behind him as he talked about things with Iwaze and Kaminari, some new game or something. Feeling bad for the way the unconscious boy was being half-heartedly scraped across the ground, Izuku stepped forward and asked to take over the role of designated Monoma holder. The steel hero shrugged and put the collar of Monoma's shirt in Izuku's hand, thanking him and transitioning smoothly back into his conversation. Izuku sighed and lifted Monoma up to lean against his own shorter form. He bore the majority of the other's weight and walked more slowly because of it and the exhaustion of the day in general. He hoped Monoma woke up and he'd not have to lug the boy all the way back to the dorms and to his room, though Izuku was curious as to what the, one, the 1B dorms were set up were like. It would be a duplicate of his own, but perhaps the other class had added little touches that made it more unique. Like the kiss-the-cook-and-die apron that Mina had gotten Kach on as a gag gift that hung up in the kitchen that he claimed to hate but wore every time he cooked on the weekends, or the little supportive sticky notes in rainbow colors that Hagakure would slap onto the walls surrounding the elevators. There had to be at least fifty by now. Or the bands of Sarah's tape on the one couch leg that, from when someone did something, as you couldn't remember what, he thinks there was definitely some sort of faux wrestling thing involved, but that rest of it was blurry. Izuka and Monoma had trailed behind the others, but just as the Height Alliance building came into view properly, the other teen stirred. He nearly tripped when he got his feet moving, so Izuku halted and tightened his grip around the boy's waist. What? Monoma mumbled, blinking and bringing a hand up to muss at his hair. Are you feeling better, Monoma-kun? Izuku asked. The phantom thief pushed him away, straightening the crumpled collar and fixing his tie. I take it that Kendo felt the need to knock me out and abandon me, leave me to fend for myself among the starving wolves of 1A. She didn't abandon you, Monomakun, Izuku said, pointedly not discussing the violence. Tetsu Tetsu was drag er, was bringing you back, but he, um, well, he wasn't exactly gentle about it, so I offered to help you instead. Sorry if that was overstepping. I know you aren't fond of us here in 1A. He started walking again, and the blonde kept pace with him despite the frown on his face, indicating that he'd rather not be beside him at all. Izuku wasn't overly concerned, though. Monoma thrived off insulting the class as a whole, it seemed. Izuku all by himself wasn't as easy of a target. Yes, well, it stands to reason that you'd be left behind as the weakest among them. You've hardly even begun to stop brutalizing yourself in every way imaginable, coupled with the— Okay, so maybe Izuku's assessment had been a little off. He crossed his arms and huffed, speeding up his walk despite the protest in his sore muscles. I'm sorry my help and general person is so detestable to you, monoma -kun. I'll see you around, I suppose. His pride shouldn't have been as bruised as it was, but Izuku thought that maybe if he'd shown the belligerent male how nice and genuine he and his peers were, 
and instill in him that competition can and should be friendly at UA, he would grow to like them, or at least hate them in a less of an overly dramatic way. Not that Kachan had much really been better in the past, but nowadays the explosive boy had begun to be less verbally abrasive outside of his actual fighting. Monoma was just plain rude, and his laugh erred more on the side of unhinged than amused, but that didn't mean that he was a bad person. He wanted to be a hero just like the rest of them. His heart had to be in the right place, even if his words never were. Wait a minute! Monoma caught up to him quickly because of those stupidly long legs of his. Great. Now Izuku was being unnecessarily mean, too. And almost touched his arm, but he seemed to think better of it at the last second. I didn't mean to... upset... you. I find that incredibly hard to believe, monoma -kun. No, it's true. I can admit when I'm in the wrong. Unlike a certain class of vainglorious, overhyped... monoma -kun. Right, right. Sorry. Force of habit. But I didn't mean to lash out at you specifically. If, if I'm honest, you're actually one of the least despicable members of 1A, and your quirk is interesting. I've never come across one so powerful that I wouldn't want to copy with my own. Mizuku's head dipped slightly in mortification. Well, I'm getting better with it. I, it's just really complex in practice, despite seeming so straightforward. And I didn't actually know it was, er, a part of me for years. I'm a little behind you and everyone else. He gripped his right arm with his left hand. Monoma's frown deepened. His gray eyes fixated on the shorter boy. You, you're catching up, though, arguably, for a late bloomer. Izuku turned to him with a smile. Yeah, yeah, I am. Thanks for noticing. Monoma looked away. Don't let it go to your head. There's, uh, enough inflated egos in your class as it is. It's only a matter of time before they all fall, thanks to their own hubris and Class B finally steps into the limelight. I'm sure both groups will keep each other on their toes, Mizuku responded. Dekakun, hurry up! Sato's going to show us how to make some cranberry scones. Mina's going to hoard all of the good ones if you don't move. Coming, the boy shouted, back to the jumping form of Uraraka at the top of the steps to their dorm. See you around, Monomakun, and try to keep an eye out for Kendo-san's chops. Monoma's eyes narrowed at the last comment, knowing it was a return for his own jab earlier, but the earnestness in the other's voice made it seem like he actually did want Monoma not to be hit again. He abruptly turned, and his coattails were flaring out as he strode back to his own room. He had more than enough of 1A's nonsense. More than enough. That green bro's pretty cute, huh, Midoriya from 1A? Tetsu Tetsu remarks to Iwaze in the locker room one day, awkwardly trying to tug off his own shirt, but his arms are bent too, and he's sort of stuck. It takes him what Monoma considers to be a frightfully long three seconds to figure out how to get out of the fabric without ripping it in half with his bare hands. Sadly, that's something he'd seen the other teen do before when particularly frustrated. I guess, the welding boy shrugs. I don't really have a thing for dudes, but he's pleasant enough to look at. Tetsu Tetsu nods. Ah, oh, man, I forgot. Not everybody swings both ways. Sometimes, because, like, my parents do and I do, and that, that one uncle of mine always shows up late to reunions because he's bad, got bad with directions, and also that old lady at the supermarket I go to. I mean, I think she always flirts with this one lady who buys a ton of cat food, but this dude came once and she totally gave him an up and down, if you know what I mean. You're getting a little off track, Tetsu, I was, I said. But, anyways, I was just thinking, like, last week, when we saw 1A, he's, you know, Midoriya. He's kind of, like, really my type, you know? Like, all soft and, like, nice, but super strong and manly. I want to spar with him so bad. Monoma scoffs in disdain. Is that some sort of euphemism? Tetsu Tetsu scrunches his brows. No, what do plants have to do with fighting? I'm talking, like, rolling around on the mat for a few rounds with the dude. I get he's green, but he's got, like, he's not like a veggie for those little bear dudes. Oh, for crying out loud. Euphemism, Tetsu Tetsu, not eucalyptus. Oh, God, I wanted to know if you were insinuating that... Never mind. He focused on making sure that the hem of his sleeves were symmetrical and adjusted his belt. He felt miffed by the metallic boy's comment, and his agitation only grew when the other misconstrued his own words so ridiculously. Eucalyptus. I don't get it. We know, Tetsu Tetsu, Kaibara said dryly. I just don't get it. We know, Tetsu Tetsu, Kaibara repeated. Anyways, I like his smile, and his freckles. He's definitely cute, so so is that sappy dude. And Kirishima, of course. I mean, like, he's my bro and my rival, but, like, still really cute. And the guns on that gravity girl, she's, like, super jacked. Love that in a lady. Love that in a person. Just, man, good arms are hot as hell. Was there a point to all this? Monoma cut in a bit more sharply than he had intended, but felt no need to apologize for it. 
Nah, just making conversation. You think any of them are cute, Monoma? Class A are nothing but slapdash collection of gestures playing knights for the amusement of Aizawa and Principal Nezu. They're all beneath me, beneath us all. And their canuppance will occur soon enough. Whoa, bro, no need for that kind of language. I would, would have settled for like a yes and some names. I didn't need to hear all your sex talk. I mean, damn, we're still in school, dude. Every day with you, Tetsu Tetsu. It's every day with you. Monoma remarked as he massaged his temples and strode over to keep his tent burn check. No, we don't have classes on Sunday, remember? I swear on my mother's life, if someone doesn't stop this, I'm going to... Iwase smoothly stepped in, patting Tetsu Tetsu on the back. Hey, buddy, on the subject of school, do you still need help with history? Yes, please, this new assignment, it's just killing me. I'm glad something is, Monoma muttered sourly to himself, stalking out of the locker room. He'd much rather wait ahead of the others while he cleared his head. Class B was his largest source of pride next to his own quirk, but gods, how they graded his own patience in times like this. The short grandfather clock hanging on the wall beat its perfect metronome rhythm in his ear as Monoma flipped through his textbook and jotted down his notes. He really needs to pick his grades up, remembering the swell of disappointment and self-loathing that had crashed into him when he'd been forced to take remedial courses during the forest training camp. His only pacifying thought had been that so many of the overly glorified 1A students had been taking the course alongside him. Of course, the fact that he had to remain in their presence for so long was detestable, so all in all, he'd not been very pleased with himself. Not to mention the villain attack. He'd been so foolish to have felt that sliver of jealousy in him when he heard of the events at the USJ, despite his jibes with the troublemaking nature of Aizawa's students. When the League had manifested in the woods, when he'd seen the genuine worry in Vlad King's eyes at the thought of any of the teens that he was in charge of being hurt. Monoma had felt fear. He'd felt it, deep and chilling, in his bones, and he could hardly fathom now how Class A had managed to fight these monsters before and make it out alive, could continue to laugh loudly at the lunch table. It had taken a while before Monoma's shame and his inaction, the limitations of his courage and quirk, grew greater than his actual fear. He'd poured himself into training harder and stretching beyond the borders of what he'd taken for granted— he had to be stronger, and better, to bring pride to Class B's name, to show the world that the children in 1A were just that, children, and he'd grow to surpass them in time along with his classmates. The other group of teens may have had some sort of odd advantage to facing villains so early and struggling as they had with that obnoxious thug being kidnapped and all, but Class B and Monoma himself had the opportunity to hone their skills and nature and the curriculum that UA intended, and that itself was an advantage too. Class A may have t tasted what it was like to be heroes with their lives on the line more often, but Class B was further along the well-trodden path that had been paved by countless UA alum before them. Monoma and his classmates would reign supreme. It was inevitable, and not a single person from 1A could stop them. Not the Todoroki prodigy or the Yayurozu heiress, or not even the latest line of the Ingenium. Not that crude and boorish ash blonde with all his snarls and rage, and certainly not Midoriya Zuku as if such a contradictory creature, with his big rounded features denoting softness and sincerity mixed with that defiant set in his jaw and the hardness of his muscles flexing as green lightning danced across them and shattered through whatever obstacle was in their way, could halt the ever-forward momentum of Class B. What uttered nonsense. Class A was just utter and complete nonsense. Izuku was tossed down hard on the training mat, but couldn't stop himself from smiling up at Tetsu Tetsu, enjoying himself. His legs wrapped around the other guy's waist in a swift movement and had reversed their positioning, pinning Tetsu Tetsu's lower half with his thick thighs and clamping his opponent's wrists down with his hands. The man underneath him let out a rush of air and his face went sort of, oh, oh right, this position was a little, well, and their chests were brushing and their faces were close and, ha, told you bro, Kirishima said loudly and Izuku got up quickly extending a hand out to help his partner up. Tetsu Tetsu accepted the hand easily and was pulled up in a smooth motion. He used his free hand to grasp Izuku's forearm and stared at him with misty eyes. I wanted to win, but, man, there's no one I'd rather have taught me. Except maybe Kirishima. That was manly battle of yours, Midoriya. Thanks. Uh, right. Yeah, th thanks. Y you as well. Um, good match. Fought well. Did he really have to say taught me, though? Izuku didn't need to think about that. Kirishima clapped them both heavily on the back, and Izuku stumbled forward slightly. He was training with me in Ojiro, so he's like got the king of mixing martial arts with a good old-fashioned bash and grabs. Tetsu Tetsu turned and threw his arms around Kirishima. Dude, bash and grab with me. Let me get some water first, but I want to throw down still. Kirishima laughed. Yeah, dude, let's rock it. 
They walked off to grab the aforementioned drink and give the steel hero a chance to catch his breath, some with their arms wrapped firm and snug and rather slow around each other's waist. Well, okay. A towel was thrown at Izuku's face, and he sputtered as he pulled it off. You're sweaty, Monoma noted. It's unbecoming, but of course it's all well and good as long as everybody plays nice and fun, right? That's your whole thing? His voice was level in volume, but the tone he had was scalding. Izuku was very confused. Um, thanks for the towel, monoma -kun. I appreciate it. Yes, well, you'd better. I'm not one to dote on those I feel aren't worth my time. Not that you'd care about me with all your focus on wrestling. Don't let me distract you from rolling around and getting dirty with whoever's next, because I'm sure... Do you want to spar with me, monoma -kun? Izuku asked before the blonde could descend into what was likely another tirade rant. Do I want... No, of course not. I would... I don't need to. There's no reason for me to. Okay, I just figured I'd ask. Would you like to take observational notes on the others, then? I don't get a chance to write about Class B all that often, and I'd like to improve on what I have so far, while Tetsutetsu, Shishida, Bondo, and Honanuki are here. Monoma appeared taken aback by Izuku's offer, but huffed and showed his agreement by trailing along after him as he tucked himself in a good spot to see all the little one-on-one -on -one matches that were spread around the room. Izuku's pen set about catching every detail while he stared out at the others, but he continued to try and have a proper conversation with Monoma, nonetheless. "'Why did you come along with the others if you had no intention of sparring?' "'I find it greatly entertaining to see my peers actually defeat yours, thoroughly in any sort of battle. Hand-to-hand -hand combat may not be my forte, but appreciating the way my classmates pummel some modesty and shame into 1A certainly is.' Izuku glanced at him. "'All right, I guess.' It was quiet then, save for the scratching of Izuku's writing utensil and the grunts of exertion from the various pairs that were duking it out. Why did you come? For Tetsutetsu's challenge? Monoma found himself asking. No, I planned on just watching and taking notes, Izuku explained, shaking his book in the air before he put it back in his lap. But Kirishima said he wanted to see Tetsutetsu and I fight. I think he said something about a manly show between mutual friends being the sort of inspirational sight he needed to give him courage. Courage? For what? Not that I particularly care about the pendant lives of you and your classmates. I'm not exactly sure, but... Izuku lowered his voice and leaned closer, sliding his book up to cover his mouth as he spoke into Monoma's ear. I think he's going to finally ask out Tetsu Tetsu. Monoma seemed to freeze in place. Ah, but you'd probably frown upon that, wouldn't you? Intermingling between our A and B, how horrid. He pulled away and smiled to show that he was just teasing when he noticed that Monoma's neck and ears were pink. Hmm... Of course not. That's... I... I might detest 1A, with good reason, but might I add, I'm not immune to the most importance of affection. Tetsutetsu's always had terrible taste, but I must admit that I doubt his desire to rise up and defeat your lot once and for all would be lessened by accepting the redhead. Even if his lust clouds his mind, Tetsutetsu's will is strong. Izuku blinked. Oh, well, as Kirishima's friend, I do take offense to the implication that he's anything less than amazing, but... That was all rather reasonable of you, almost congenial even. Yes, well, don't expect it again. I just think there aren't many op options for Tetsu Tetsu out there. I hardly want to subject him to anyone, but if he's found happiness or will find it soon enough with your friend, just just let them be, I say, Monoma said, and Izuku nodded. I agree. Nothing wrong with romance, after all, the blonde continued. Exactly. Nothing wrong with feeling unexpected ways about someone else. His voice was high and borderline frantic now. Yeah, Izuku continued, a little curious as to where this was going, and a lot worried about being present for it. Nothing wrong about considering someone in an entirely new light, despite the fact that you have little, if anything, in common, and on some level you can hardly stand to be near them, because a part of you keeps imagining what it would have been like if you had met earlier in life, or had been pushed together by fate instead of pitted against each other by nature. Yeah, okay... Yeah, monoma -kun, I'm now entirely convinced that we're no longer talking about kirishima -kun and Tetsu-Tetsu, and that we really ought to get you to recovery, girl, because you're looking incredibly pale, and you're about to pass out, and wait, don't stand up so abruptly, or... Monoma swayed and fell sideways as his eyes rolled up, Izuku's arms catching him before he could actually slam into the ground. Or you'll actually pass out, is what I was going to say. Sir Monoma be stricken with illness? Pray tell, will he be removed post-haste and directed toward the infirmary with which Shishida began before Hananuki slapped his arm to shut him up? 
the big guy here will just keep spouting Shakespeare for the next ten minutes. You all right taking him to R.G. on your own, or do you want one of us to help? Mizuku sighed and took a moment to get Monoma into a more suitable hold for transport, supporting the lankier body against his own toward the middle of his back. The blonde's head rested what Izuku hoped was a comfortable position on his upper chest. Not that it mattered much with the other boy being unconscious, but Izuku had been called soft-hearted many, many, many times in his life. No, thank you, I'll be fine, but if Kirishima-kun could bring my notes back to the dorms for me, I'd really appreciate it. Sure thing, Midoriya, count on me. Izuku left with his last thank you and a general shout of goodbye to everyone. Was that a bridal carry, Tetsu? Looked like it, Kiri. Manly as hell. Manly as hell, Tetsu Tetsu agreed, nodding sagely. A charlatan, Monoma morosely called from the couch, and the students milling around the living room all ignored him. An ignorant deceiver masquerading as a prophet, he went on, undaunted by the silence his words were met with. Kendo's eye twitched. Monoma's head tossed back as his voice rose. Blasphemous! A traitor to my own cause! Manga tried to put his hand up, but Tokage was just too nice. What are you talking about, Monoma? The collective sigh of disappointment and exasperation from the other occupants in the room had caused her to flinch slightly, but Monoma showed no signs of acknowledging anything, or other than the fact that he was spoken to. I've committed treason of the highest order. Tokage-san, Tartarus itself would not be enough to truly punish me for what I've done. Kendo pinched her brows. For the love of all that is holy, Monoma, could you at least seize the dramatics for a single moment? Just one. It's not too much to ask. I've not led a life of sin. I don't deserve to be subjected to this kind of abuse. The phantom thief laughed, though it was more of a derisive and self-deprecating cackle than anything implying actual amusement. You think you've had it rough, Kendo-san? I've been cursed by that ghastly, manipulative creature into questioning the very ideals that have guided my every moment within this academy. But he just appears before me, stumbles into my life like a natural disaster, and rips my roots, the foundation of my life, Kendo, right up from the ground. I'm a tetherless and full of disgusting curiosity about him, and that absolutely sickens me. I should go back to recovery, girl. Literally just a crush, Kendo mumbled. Kamakiri released a series of clicks that the others recognized as his laughter, rather rare to hear from him as he was kind of self-conscious about it. Going to be carried there by Prince Charming again. He looked so stupid in the halls the other day, snuggled up like a princess. More clicking was heard before he was chastised by Kamori, but the girl was muffling her own distinct laughter as well, behind a few mushrooms, so it had very little effect. The copycat teen just glared. Feel free to allow me to wallow in my suffering alone and continue my crisis of self-identification in peace. Do it in your room, then, and not a public place, Kaibara said without remorse. Monomo was seriously contemplating beating the boy and laughing teens with the nearest couch pillow or perhaps screaming into it for a good hour. So when Yagi slid up soundlessly on his left side and placed her hand on his shoulder, startling everyone except her, he swore he felt his soul leave his body at the touch, and when it drifted back, he tilted his head to look up at her. She didn't smile at him, though. Truthfully, he wasn't sure if she was even capable of it, and her voice was as quiet and toneless as it always was. You have feelings for Midoriya. They do not necessarily mean that your other, more established feelings are automatically invalidated. You don't have to act on any of them, either. She shuffled away toward the kitchen, and Monoma was struck by the solid and encouraging nature of her advice, and because that might have been the longest string of words anyone had ever put together by the, the ghost-like girl. Taking a cursory glance around the room at the variety of astonished faces, Monoma confirmed it. Yanagi never spoke that much, and for her to have done so to help Monoma was actually incredibly sweet, and considerate. Yes, those are excellent points, Yanagi-san. Thank you. He managed to get out after a few moments of just gaping at her. She glanced at him from the kitchen and silently continued to prepare herself a pot of coffee, which the other students watched her dump into a large bowl of soup and shuffle to the elevators with, sipping occasionally. It was quiet enough to hear a pin drop in the aftermath of the elevator door sliding shut over the impassive young woman. She just left with like six cups of coffee in a bowl, like not even any milk or sugar or anything. I didn't even know we had coffee in the kitchen. What the fuck? Like, seriously, what the fuck? Kororo asked, slipping from behind the curtain and scaring the group of teens yet again. Were you there the whole time? Tokagi questioned. I fell asleep. I should be paid for this, Kendo said to herself. I should be paid and financially compensated for all of this. Generously. Izuku finished his fifth lap around the track and wiped his face down, looking for his water bottle. A flash of red caught his eye, and he saw that Monoma was sitting under a tree nearby with his bottle. 
The blonde shook it in the air again, and Izuku jogged over, slipping down next to the other teen and enjoying the blessed coolness of the tree's shadow. He took the bottle and popped the top open with his teeth. Poisoned, I take it? He joked, taking a few hearty gulps before slowing down. Monoma didn't laugh, but his lips twitched upward, and that was good enough for Izuku. Clearly, he wasn't the worst company the guy had ever had, and it was actually nice to know. You're pretty good company, actually. Oh, said that last bit out loud, huh? Sorry, bad habit. Comes with the mumbling. And the unnecessary apologies. Yep, sorry, Izuku added cheekily, enjoying the bit of light banter, and Monoma did laugh this time, knocking Izuku's shoulder with his own. The green-haired boy was genuinely thrown off his rhythm by it, the laughing, not the playful nudge. Monoma didn't sound like all hoity-toity and snide this time. It was the sound he made was pleasant, like real and happy. He looked handsome when he laughed like that, his smile softer and far less creepy than normal. His eyes crinkled a bit at the corners, the hint of a leg, a little bit of a dimple on his right cheek. Izuka started noticing the way that the light filtering through the leaves had caught on the blonde's hair, and it made it shine a bit like a pale gold and quickly turned his head to hide the beginnings of a blush on his face. He started fiddling with the bottle, pushing the cap down, pulling it back up with his teeth in an attempt to stop his mouth from forming words like, You look nice like this, or I like the sound of your laugh. When the urge to blurt out the phrases had passed, he stopped the repetitive motion immediately. It had probably annoyed the other, actually. He chanced a peek out of the corner of his eyes to see whether or not he was annoyed enough to deserve an apology. And they'd just gotten over that, hadn't they? And saw that Monoma was already staring at him. Not in a hostile way, just looking closely. Nervously, Izuku patted his own cheeks and tugged on a few stray curls. Something on my face? In my hair? Monoma blinked rapidly like he was taken out of a trance and coughed. He was nodding. Yes, here, I doubt you'll be able to find it just flailing about like an idiot. He lightly swatted Izuku's hands to get him to shift them out of the way, then slid his fingers through the green locks for a moment or two. He pulled away with his fingers pinched tight together around something, but Izuku couldn't see what it was before Monoma had tossed the grass behind him. It had to have been small, because Izuku hadn't felt anything being tugged out from his no-doubt no messy head and his hair and scalp were all kind of sensitive. Maybe it was a dandelion fluff or a piece of fuzz from a shirt or something. Monoma must have good eye for details if he had caught something tiny like that. Got it, the blonde said and gave a small smile. It was a nice smile. It suited his face. Izuku should stop that train of thought before he said something silly out loud again. Blue, he said, abruptly. So much for not saying something silly. Was that a new record for him? A whole four seconds? Monoma looked confused. What? Izuku ducked his head down and started ripping up the grass to collect in a small pile. It's not like important or anything. I just, uh, back when I first helped you after Kendo-san's, er, intervening a while ago, I noticed that your eyes are kind of bluish. I thought they were just gray when I first met you, but they're not. They're sort of... Bluey. Intelligent. Well said. Full marks on that one, Izuku. Bluey. What the hell was wrong with him? Oh, yes, it's part of the reason the accents in my hero costume are blue. To make them pop. Appearances are important to the hero work, after all. That and blue happens to be my favorite color. Not in a narcissistic way, I just like it. Though I've recently been kind of interested in green, too. Green's nice, I suppose. I'm a bit used to it, Izuku said, ruffling his hair. But it is nice. Blue's really pretty, though, and red is fun, vibrant. He shook his water bottle and knocked his shoes together to emphasize his point. Yes, I agree, though green feels more lively to me than red does. Reminds you of plants, right? Living things and all that? He suddenly felt sort of bad about the pile of ripped-up grass and smoothed it out like that would help somehow, but a bit late for that, Izuku. Maybe, or maybe it's something else, Monoma said cryptically. Izuku giggled. Why are we even talking about colors right now? You brought it up. You kept the conversation going, though. You could have just let it taper off into awkwardness. That's like my go-to thing. Well, forgive me for actually wanting to chat with you longer. I promise next time I wish to converse, I'll just sit in silence beside you and wait for you to get up and leave me alone instead. The teen responded while rolling his eyes. No, don't do that, Izuku cried in faux pain. How can I face the day without Monoma Neto's ceaseless haranguing of all the flaws of 1A and the vague premonitions of our inevitable demise under the onslaught of the superior in every conceivable way team of 1B. I just can't imagine what life would be like without knowing exactly how much you hate me and my classmates at any given moment. I don't hate you. Mizuku swallowed and met Monoma's wide eyes with his own, 
The other was quick to add a clause to his previous statement. As much, not as much as the others. You should be just as bad, really, being cut from the same cloth as them, but you aren't. You're more tolerable, so I don't hate you as much. His voice grew quieter. Not, not really at all, I guess, if I'm being honest. That's, that's nice. For the record, I, well, I don't hate you either. You're also tolerable, Mona Makun. Thank you, Midoriya. No problem. It's literally the least I can do, but I get how it was probably really hard for you to admit that to me, so really I should be the one saying that. So thank you, Mona Makun. You're welcome. The quiet that had descended between them under the shade of the tree was soothing and pleasant. Izuku wasn't heated from the run anymore, and if anything, it was a bit on the cooler side now that he was resting, yet somehow a part of him still felt sort of warm. He liked it. My boyfriend is so freaking badass and cute, you know. We were just making out and he cut my lip on accident because we both have sharp teeth and I was just going to lick it and move on, right? But he pulls away and says sorry all sweetly and gave it a little kiss and rubs my face and asks if I'm okay and if I wanted to go see Recovery Girl. He's so freaking perfect. You've said that like eight times today, Tetsu. Iwase said with a groan. We get it. You love Kirishima. Hell yeah, I do. That's why I kept the busted lip since he gave it to me. Like a little battle scar, but with more love and less fighting. I got kind of really excited after it, too. And now, Kiri's lip matches. Kind of like he's got two cuts. Looks hot, not gonna lie. Tasted weird, but eh. He shrugged. Mint, or maybe milk with honey, Monoma murmured, twirling his pen and staring out the window of the library. Uh, what? Hmm? Nothing, just thinking about uh, homework. Homework, Iwase repeated skeptically. Homework about what? Tea flavors? Tea is a suitable comparison. Calming. Smells nice. Lifts my mood. Warm. Oh, gods. He's mooning over the little bunny guy again, as if we need another Tetsu around. Keep your swooning to yourself, princess, Kamakiri said, clicking up a storm again. Tetsu Tetsu looked confused for a second before his face lit up, and he grabbed Mona by the shoulders, shaking him as he whooped with joy. Yeah, that's awesome, bro. You like Midoriya. So he's your type after all, huh? Cool. Ooh, double dates. Monoma pulled himself out of the iron grip with a grimace, scooting his chair so he'd be out of range. I'm not dating him, idiot, and I don't see why I would ever go on a double date with you and the rockhead if I were. Uh, cause we're all friends, dude. Duh. And don't call him a rockhead. We aren't all friends. You're my classmates and they're members of the class that's destined to be crushed underneath of our feet as we rise and take the glory of unmatched champions in UA's Hall of Fame, to be remembered for eons as the— Aw, oh, man, I thought we were friends— the other boy cut in, visibly dropping. He looked like a kicked puppy, a bulky puppy that could break through walls with ease and withstand immense heat and pressure, but a puppy nonetheless. And annoyingly, Monoma kind of liked dogs. Stupid, cute little mutts. He sighed and tentatively patted an arm. That came out, I suppose considering the amount of time that we've spent together and the many trials that we've faced as a team, one could make the argument that we're on friendly terms. Hell yeah, friends! No double dates, though. I can't afford to jeopardize mine and Midoriya's brain cell count by spending inordinate amounts of time with you and your equivalently ludicrous boyfriend. A lot of big words, but whatever. You do like him a lot, though, hmm? Kirishima, you're happier, together in a romantic sense, when you're just... compared to when you were pals. Of course. Dude means a lot to me. I know we're, like, young and stuff, and it's not like we're promised forever or even past high school, you know? We're going to become heroes, and then we might be stationed on opposite sides of the nation or something. I don't know the future. He doesn't, but I want to make the, his present good for him, and he wants the same for me. We do that by being together, simple as that. And it was simple, yet rather profound, not exactly the type of philosophical answer one would expect from the boy who tripped and dented a wall with his thick, quick skull. But during the first week of school, who could expect more from him? Though there was a chance that it was just a rumor. Monoma hadn't seen it himself, but Kaibara had said it happened, and, well, Kaibara didn't really have a reason to lie. Tetsu Tetsu grinned, teeth looking especially sharp and dangerous, too. And I still have yet to pay him back for the sports festival. He motivates me like nothing else, to be better. Better, huh? Monoma said softly as he thought of the note that Midori had slipped him earlier, which meant him struggling with English and history, and held his cell phone number on it for him to text it any difficult questions to. The look in those green eyes when he thanked him, the way the words, I don't hate you, had slipped out of his own mouth so easily and readily like he'd been waiting to say it for ages. Just two days ago. Better, he repeated thoughtfully. Was Midoriya, could he be motivating Monoma to be better? And 
more importantly, could Monoma ever do the same for him? The texting gradually morphed into something more loose and neutral than conversations about phonetics and foundation dates for famous hero agencies. Midoriya went off on tangents that ranged from music to comics to hypotheticals about other animals with quirks, like their benevolent and enigmatic principle, making sure to emphasize that he was interested in observational research but was entirely against any experimentation on any such creatures. And Monoma let the derailing happen, contributing to it more with his probing questions about Midoriya's favorite foods, what Midoriya liked to do for fun, why he modeled his hero costume after a long-eared rodent. The last one earned him some radio silence that bore an obvious undertone of embarrassment and righteous anger. And then he received a text that was clearly not meant for him, that made his heart lodge in his throat and all sound in the moderately busy common room muffle like he was underwater or something. He'd read it twice before shooting to his feet and booking it to his room, not even bothering with the elevator, just taking the stairs two or three at a time. It was a wonder he didn't fall and smash his face in. Breathing hard, he slammed the door behind him and tossed himself in his desk chair like a rag doll. Message from Midoriya Momo-san, what does kissing feel like? The soft tune he'd set for Midoriya's incoming messages. It had these guitar strums over a few quiet piano keys and was named Dawn or Morning Glow or something in the list of pre-programmed ringtones on his phone. It came through again and again as more was added. I'm just asking because of the conversation that we had before about, um, well... Liking someone of the same gender as you, and I had this dream, or daydream, I guess, about being kissed by this guy I think I might like, and I know it's not the same, but you're the only one I know who's dating someone aside from Kirishima-kun, and I don't think he'd explain it in a way that I could understand. It's silly, because he probably doesn't even like me back, but I keep thinking about it, and if I ever do confess and he accepts my feelings, I just, how will I know if I'm kissing right? I just, I've never did it before. You're not Momo-san. Mon Monoma-kun, please, ignore that whole thing. I am so sorry. Your names are next to each other on my phone. Sorry, don't read that if you haven't already. I'm so sorry. Don't hate me or, or laugh. I'll die, please. You're fine. Fine like you didn't read it. I read it. There's nothing to worry about, though I get it. It was a private conversation with a friend. I shouldn't have read it when I saw a name that wasn't mine, but I did. So I'm sorry. But you're fine, I think. You key smashed and made a bunch of typos, so maybe not. I might die anyway. I can't move past this, can I? I'm so sorry. Forget this, and preferably also forget my existence. I said you're fine, so you're fine. I'm curious about your little crush, though, but I'm not going to pry, unless you feel like sharing. Which one of those spineless, arrogant, insufferable Class A mongrels had warped their stupid selves into something that thought themselves worthy of Midoriya, who had tricked the teen into blushing as he walked just slightly behind them in the halls, what boy had the gall to catch his pretty green eyes? No, 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 I'm mortified enough as it is, Mona McCoon. I can't tell you that. My heart couldn't take it. I'll tell you mine. All's fair in love and war and what not. It's also a boy, if that helps ease you at all. Midoriya? Oh, um, I, I didn't know you, um, I mean, there's a lot here at UA. Statistically, they say seven in every twelve identifies as something other than straight nowadays, so we're in the majority. We're two of that statistic now, right? Huh. <laughs> Didn't need the lesson, but okay. So who's the lucky guy? Lucky in that he was determined to be attractive to you, not that he'd be lucky to have you. Ha! Not that anyone wouldn't be. Lucky, that is, for you to have... To have you. Fuck. Language, monoma -kun. We don't need mo more heroes out there like Kachan. Don't distract from the matter at hand. Is it Bakugo? Is that why you mentioned him? Have a thing for shitty blondes who can't be bothered to wear uniforms properly. That obnoxious prick. Blustering around with his explosions and stupidly spiked hair, thinking he's so above them all when Monoma's the one who wants to treat Midoriya right, and... I don't think it's really a type thing, but he is blonde. Um, not Kachan, though. I don't have a death wish. Monoma racked his brain to recall the other pathetic vain losers in the class. Blonde. Blonde. Who was blonde? Tailboy. He seems too plain for you. He's not plain, but he is just a friend. I mean, I, I, I guess the guy I like is a friend, too, but I don't know. It's different. You want to be kissed by this friend. That's a lot different. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Have you kissed anyone yet? Is that okay to ask? I mean, you said you had a crush, so you want to kiss someone now, I think. I'm assuming you want to kiss him? A lot. Kiss him. I want to a lot, I mean. I haven't yet with anyone. He'd be my first, but he's not interested. And you are kissing. Not everyone likes kissing, I guess, but you... But you what? You'd be nice to kiss, I think. Thought about it before. A lot. Blonde. 
I'm blonde. I'm blonde and I have a crush on you and you have one on me. I guess. Yes, I mean, yes. It's late. We should sleep. It's not that late. Are you thinking about kissing right now? Are you? Don't ignore me. I'm going to bed. Yes, but good night, Mona McCoon. Good night, Midoriya. Mona McCoon was there under the same tree that they talked to before when Izuku finished his run. He debated running another few laps until the boy left before he shook his head at his own cowardice and jogged up to sit beside the blonde. His water bottle was pressed into his hands and his fate felt ridiculously warm. The workout, obviously. The workout and the sun. You're sweaty and gross. I know. Izuku was trying to process and remove some of the said sweat from his towel with a f flash of impishness, but the other's words had made him leave the sweat on the nape in his collar alone. A sudden breeze cooled those spots more than the rest of him, and he almost cracked a little vindictive smile at that. You're one of the most laudable members of the most egregiously abominable classes to tarnish UA's name and stain the legacies embedded in every square inch of its campus. So you've told me, Izuku took a large swig of water, wiping his mouth with the back of his hand. I fell asleep last night thinking about holding your hand, kissing you under this tree like I wanted to the other day. Izuku's fingers sprayed in the grass, and he fought the ridiculous urge to rip some up and throw them at Monoma, and then flee. So, he asked instead, you think you're special? I thought the same. Uzuku's voice was supposed to sound challenging and maybe a little judgmental, possibly condescending, maybe a little flirtatious as well. It came out passive-aggressive at best, and the way he practically whispered the last sentence just made it seem like he was waiting for something. Which he was, but still. So, Monoma said, hand falling to rest on Uzuku's, and there must be some fancy telekinesis quirk at work, because that jerk had the copied and it was using because Izuku's head was turning just to face him, and his eyes met bluish-gray ones before shutting too tight and he was holding his breath, and then something pressed against his lips and just stayed there immobile for a moment. A little oddly textured, Monoma's lips were a little chapped, and they were thinner than Izuku's, so they didn't match up perfect. Monoma pulled back, and Izuku opened one eye, and then the other when he determined it was okay to do so. The copycat team was just looking at his face with this little soft smile. His eyes moved to rest on Izuku's freckles, then his eyes, his mouth, his eyes again, his mouth again. Izuku wasn't smiling, but he sucked the bottom lip in and flexed the hand that was under the blondes before huffing and kissing the boy for a second time. "'Does this mean you might grow to hate 1A a little less?' Izuku asked as he pulled away, shifting to press his back and his head against the tree. Monoma mirrored his position, though his head was angled slightly towards Izuku, even though the one-for-all user was looking up at the sky and nodded him. No, of course not. Mutually exclusive feelings exist. I hate them the same amount, maybe more, for hiding you from me this whole time. Hiding, he says, like I was just crouching behind Sato and waiting for you to come sweep me off my feet. You're sure it'd make sense. And you've picked me up several times. I'd return the favor, but I'd need to borrow a quirk first. I hate you. You don't. I don't hate you either. Izuku lets his head fall on Monoma's upper arm, not caring that his curls were probably tickling his neck or likely to find their way into his mouth if the breeze picked up again. That's nice, I guess, not hating the person you want to kiss. Hmm, I was sort of banking on doing that pretty often for the foreseeable future, so I'll have to agree with you. I don't like the way those words tasted in my mouth, though. Get used to it. I've been told I'm pretty easy to agree with. How nauseating. They were definitely holding hands now, and Izuku was practically plastered to Monoma's side. It was quiet, warm, pleasant. Izuku held himself back from saying something dumb, like, I want to do things like this more often with you, or let's just stay here for a while. They did stay there for a while anyway, just sitting beside each other, outside for an hour or so and enjoying the other's company, without any more words. This concludes... A Thief's Heart. I really do like this fic a lot. I think it's a great dynamic for Izuku and Monoma, which doesn't get shown a lot. It's a nice rare pairing. Um, hope you guys enjoyed it as well. And as always, thank you all so much for listening.